great to see you all this morning. My name is Marty. I'm a minister here, and it's great to welcome you all to worship this morning, but especially those of you who are here for the first time. And we hope you feel at home amongst us here at Raven Hill and enjoy being here this morning. I can worship with us and make ease with the Lord. God calls us to worship Him. And I'm going to read some words from one of the Psalms. Praise the Lord, O people of God. Let all your inmost being praise His holy name. And forget not all His benefits. He who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. He who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things. Praise the Lord, O people of God. Let all your inmost being praise His holy name. We're going to stand together and praise the Lord in song, but I want to encourage you this morning not just to, to praise the Lord from your lips, but praise Him from your heart. Let your inmost being praise Him this morning. So as you sing the songs out loud, engage your heart and your mind in the words that you're singing. Let's praise the Lord from our inmost being. Let's stand together and sing. And we're going to sing two songs in a, in a row, so stay on your feet in between the two.
this morning so much for all of the amazing gifts that you have given us to enjoy in this life. We thank you for our favourite food and our favourite drinks. We thank you for our favourite places and our favourite people. We thank you for our favourite TV programmes and songs, our favourite hobbies and pastimes, our favourite walking routes and holiday destinations, our favourite possessions and club memberships. Oh Lord, we know this morning that everything that we have and enjoy is from you, and we thank you for it, Lord. And Lord, this morning we thank you too that joy was your idea. We thank you, Lord, that you created us as people with the capacity for joy and for enjoyment of things and people. And Lord, this morning we praise you and thank you that you are a God of joy, and that the fruit of the Spirit's work in our life is joy. Lord God, thank you so much for all the things that bring us joy today, all the things that we delight in, all the wonderful gifts from your hand that we enjoy. And Lord, we want to thank you this morning that you are someone that we can enjoy too. Thank you, Lord, that in our life we enjoy your presence with us every day. Thank you, Lord, that we enjoy your peace within us when our world feels like it's falling apart. Thank you, Lord, that we enjoy your blessing around us through relationships and things and people. Lord, thank you too that we get to enjoy your love and your guidance in our life. Thank you that we enjoy your protection and your leading, your forgiveness and your assurance. Thank you, Lord, that we not only get to enjoy all of the gifts that you give us, but that we get to enjoy you, a relationship with you, being at peace with you, the generous giver of all the gifts that we have. But Lord, we confess this morning that sometimes we forget that you are a God who is for our joy. We confess this morning that sometimes we wrongly think of you as a killjoy or a God who is against us enjoying life. How far, Lord, that is from the truth. Lord, we're sorry for thinking that of you. And we're sorry for thinking that of you, especially when you've given us so much to enjoy in our lives. And Lord, we're sorry to you this morning for at times being so overjoyed by the gifts you give us, but fairly apathetic that we have you in our lives. We're sorry, Lord, for at times being so joyless about our relationship with you, for being so joyless about knowing you and being known by you. Lord, we know that your desire for us is joy. Joy in you and in all you give us. We ask that you'd help us to believe this today and to live lives that are overflowing with the joy that you bring. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me read some words of encouragement and some words of assurance. If you're someone who just would like to enjoy God more and maybe don't, the Lord says this, Sing, daughter of Zion, shout aloud, Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. Rejoice today, O people of God. The Lord is in your life, and he is with you. Now, in February, we've been learning a memory verse. Uh, certainly in our house, we've had it a lot, and it's been great. And maybe I hope some of the adults have remembered it, but this morning we're going to give the children the chance to come up and to say it. Okay, well, I think as adults, we should stand together and say it one more time with the accent. So let's all stand together. I wonder, do you remember? Oh, that's fantastic. Do you remember? The words aren't on the screen. <laughs> I did say we'll be learning this as a church family, not just as kids, so let's see, okay, you ready? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That was terrible, but I'll forgive you. Okay, so next month we'll be checking again, have a seat. Now, was it with anyone's birthday in February? Did anyone have a birthday in February? We're the last Sunday of February. Any boys and girls with a birthday in February? Okay, that's, that's the problem. Great. Well, we're going to stand together and sing the, the new song that we've heard this month as well, The Big Family of God. So let's stand together and sing Big Family of God.
very short uh, congregational meeting for voting members. So if you're a voting member of the church, can I just encourage you to, to remain behind next Sunday morning after the service, and hopefully we will be no more than kind of five minutes. Um, so uh, we're, we're doing that because we're electing a new congregational committee, and as part of the process, I need to read out for a second week a list of the names of those who have been nominated for committee and are also happy to be elected onto the committee. So these are the folks that you'll be voting on next week. Adam Callender, David Coulter, Jenny Crawford, Jim Cowan, Peter Ferguson, Kerry Ferguson, Mark Hamilton, James Johnston, Norma Landrum, Marion McGill, Andrew McKee, Michelle Eaves, Rebecca Maxwell, Ronnie Moore, Pamela McGowan, Colin Scott, Johnny Watson, and Annika Watson. So next Sunday morning, if you can remain behind after the service, just for hopefully no more than five or ten minutes, we'll elect those folk to the Congregational Committee. Now the reason why the, that needs to be short next week is because it's also our monthly lunch together as a church family. So next Sunday morning after the service, you're invited to go over to the halls and we're going to have hot dogs again, thanks to Janet Maxwell. So Janet, thank you for those. We, we loved them last time. So there'll be hot dogs in the halls after the service next week. Or if you don't like hot dogs, bring your own lunch and come along and enjoy some time together as a church family. We had a really brilliant time uh, last time. It was just so lovely to see people of all ages and stages and people meeting each other for the first time. So I just encourage you, come over and enjoy some time together next Sunday morning. And if you have a roast for your dinner, sure, have it in the evening or be wild and have it on a Monday. Go crazy. Uh, but yeah, to do that, come next week and enjoy some time together as a church family. Also, I feel like there's lots of announcements for next Sunday, but it's important you know these things. Next Sunday evening, we normally gather here at 7 o'clock, but next Sunday evening, we're not meeting here in the evening. Instead, we're meeting at Stormont Presbyterian Church at 7 o'clock for a presbytery service. That will be organised by the Mission in Ireland, and it will be a wonderful evening together as the East Belfast Presbytery. So instead of coming here next Sunday night and being disappointed with a closed door, come to Stormont and enjoy some fellowship with other churches in the presbytery. Uh, and also just a reminder for the ladies that the ladies are meeting uh, on Wednesday this week at 10.30 a.m. at the Art Cafe at Orangefield just for a cup of coffee and a catch-up. So if you're a lady and you'd like to meet some other ladies from the church and you're free on Wednesday morning, you're invited along to that. And there is another ladies event on Wednesday night and Angela is there. And she's going to come and tell us a bit about it. loved Marty praying to God, uh, uh, thanking him for our favourite things. Um, a couple of favourite things I have that I thank God for is music. I love music and I actually love dancing. Um, not that I'm very good at singing and I'm not very good at dancing. But anyway, um, a couple of verses came to mind there. In Ecclesiastes, it says uh, in chapter 3, it says, um, there's a time to weep and a time to laugh a time to mourn and a time to dance and you know life is full of ups and downs and so when we were we were thinking of a, an event for women and Emma and I came up with the idea that there's a lady that goes around a lot of churches uh, she was in Bangor West I think not so long ago and she was teaching some of the women to dance to do a wee bit of line dancing and so we thought this would be a good idea so we got in touch with her and she's kindly offered to come on Wednesday night to um, teach us to do it at this here. So hopefully, it's if you're a woman, it doesn't matter what age, as long as you can move about a bit. And we will laugh together as we learn to dance together. And so we hope it will be a fun night. And then afterwards, we'll have some tea and coffee and sweet treats. So if you don't want to dance, you can come along and eat. So if you're up for it, it's Wednesday night at half past seven and uh, we think it will be a good time to laugh and a good time to dance. And we all need that in our lives, so we do. So thank you. Okay. And by the way, just come, come along. You don't need to sign up or anything. We'll fit you in. Will there be any video evidence, Angela? Will there be any video evidence of the night? No, no video was taken that night. So we can all make it a laugh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so sounds fun. Um, if you walk out the doors later on, um, out the doors, the very far doors, and you have a wee look up, you'll see a stained glass window. And the stained glass window 
It's depicting something that happened here in this congregation a hundred years ago this week. And let me read a little account of it, uh, just to let you know what happened. There was a unanimous decision by the Kirk Session of Raven Hill Presbyterian Church in November 1922 to extend a hearty invitation to W.P. Nicholson to use Raven Hill Church as a centre for his East Belfast mission. The decision led to the mission taking place on the 21st of February 1923, so 100 years ago this week. This was a special men's only meeting, so forget the women's night, this was a men's night. And it was for shipyard workers. Led by the Salvation Army Band, they marched from the shipyard to the church. Isn't that amazing? This band, Salvation Army Band, marching from the shipyard right up here to the church. Now, I'm not saying ministers can be a bit forgetful, but we can. So unfortunately, when they got to the church, the gates were closed. <laughs> The Reverend John Ross recorded, when the gates were open, the crowd was so large that the men got wedged between the pillars, and so fierce was the struggle to get in that the central pillar was moved from its place. Maybe a bit of a myth, but the idea was they crushed and they pushed to get into this building. The men were eventually allowed entrance, and that night, William, or WP, preached with amazing power. As a result of the con of conversions of many in the shipyard, Harlan and Wolf shipbuilders were obliged to open a large shed in which to store the tools and other items of property which had been stolen and then returned. This large storage shed became known as the Nicholson Shed. A Presbyterian weekly records the following report concerning the closing days of the mission. A great number responded to the appeal by, by their decision to follow Christ. The records show that the number of persons admitted to the Lord's table that year for the first time was 110. And the following year, the total number of communicants reached 556 out of 600 families. So 100 years ago this week, there was this amazing mission to men, where many men responded to the gospel. On Wednesday, it was 21st during the week, and I got a message on Facebook. And I just want to read it as a reminder to what God can do when just one person comes to Christ. So whenever I post on Facebook, I normally say something like, it can take courage to visit a church for the first time, and then we blur about inviting people to come. So this lady says this, I just peeked at your link above. It does take courage to enter a church for the first time. I just wanted to share that 100 years ago today, February 21st, my grandfather was sitting in his bedroom in Belfast as a young man and heard a band marching down his street. It was the Salvation Army, so he decided to check it out. He followed them to the doors of your church and found the courage to go inside. There he heard the gospel and made the decision to follow Jesus and his life and the trajectory of our family changed for eternity. He eventually moved to Toronto, Canada, married and had my dad. There are now four generations of dog arts serving Jesus as pastors, worship leaders, missionaries, teachers, etc. Thank you for your witness in Belfast. It has been felt across the pond. Isn't that incredible? I shared this at the session and John Murray shared that his father and father became a Christian at that night too. And it's just amazing what God can do. When one person comes to faith in Christ, it has this ripple effect that changes lives for generations. And I'd like to lay this just in a time of prayer, asking that the Lord would revive us as a people and bring revival in our land. So let's pray together. Oh Lord, the psalmist says, will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Our Father in heaven, as we think about the Israelites who in Psalm 85 asked, will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you, we wonder what kind of revival they were wanting to experience, what they were wanting to see from you, why they were in need of revival, and why did they need it to come from you. Lord, like the Israelites this morning, we pray for revival among us, your people, and among your people here in Northern Ireland. Lord, we want to see your greatness again, and we want to experience your glory in a very powerful way. 
We want to be awed by you once more. And we want to see things happen that only can be done by you. And we want these things, Lord, because like the Israelites, we often forget just how mighty you are. We often forget how much we need you. We often forget, like the Israelites, that our sin and selfishness keeps us from recognizing your power. So Lord, we pray for revival this morning. And we pray, Lord, that you would revive us, your people, primarily. Revive in us our love for you, Lord. Revive our awe of you. Revive our gratitude to you. Revive our desire for you. Revive our appreciation for the gospel so that we can be good news in our community. Revive our worship so that our passion for you can be rekindled. Revive our joy so that we can celebrate your goodness. Revive our compassion for our neighbors so that we will serve them with acts of mercy. Revive our concern for the spiritually lost so that we will be inspired to share the gospel of Christ with them that brings salvation. Revive our burden for the broken so that we can be agents of your healing. O oh Lord, as the psalmist prayed, revive us, Lord. Revive us. And Lord, in reviving your church, would you also then begin to revive our community and our society? Lord, would you revive our church in such a way that people want to hear the good news? That they begin to pour into churches or pour into mission events to hear about Christ. Oh Lord, we long to see a mighty work of your hand. We long to see your spirit move in such a powerful way that many people are swept into the kingdom of God. Oh Lord, your church is declining all over the world. Your church is declining in this part of the world in particular. Lord, would you revive us and would you bring revival once more that the name of Jesus might be honored and that your glory might be displayed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, can I encourage you please to take a Bible? And if you're using a church Bible, I'd like to encourage you to turn to page 1188, 1188. And we're going to finish off our series in 1 Thessalonians this morning. So we've been working through the letter of 1 Thessalonians and we're going to finish it this morning. So we're going to read this morning from verses 12 through to 28. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're going to read from verses 12 through to 28. And this is God's word to his church in Thessalonians and also God's word to us, his church today. Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other. And to everyone else. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So please do keep that open. We're going to come to look at that in just a moment. And we will not be focusing on the part of giving your brother a holy kiss, just in case you're worrying. Um, but we are going to look at a few verses of this and just really hone in on what the Lord wants to say through them. So let's stand together and sing before we come to look at God's word. And if you're in P7 and onwards and you want to go into forwards, you can do that during this song.
that God is most glorified through us in that. And so this morning, as we come to the end of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I want us to focus in on just a few verses that are going to teach us how we can enjoy God more. There's some of you here this morning, and for you the idea of enjoying God is a strange one. To enjoy God, you've never really thought about it very much. And then there's some of you here who think, well, I enjoy God a little, but I'd like to enjoy Him more. Well, this morning we're going to hone in on just a few verses that are going to teach us how to enjoy God more and more and more. But before we get to those verses, I think it's important that we just do a kind of brief overview of verses 12 to 22, just so you know what's happening in these verses. And whenever I was 18, um, I went on a lad's holiday. I'm not going to tell you any stories, but let's put it this way. There was 12 of us. I was 18. We were away from home for the first time. It was just chaos. But anyway, the thing that I had to do, this was before the days of Zoom and before the days of mobile phones, the thing that I had to do as soon as I arrived in Benidorm was I had to call my parents and let them know I was okay. So I did it. I was a good son. I went to the payphone and we had that chat. I'm here. We're fine. It's all good. I had a little bit of a conversation and as you got to the end of the phone call, a little bleep started to happen. You know, there were 30 seconds left. The phone call was about to die. And in those 30 seconds, my mum could just say so much. <laughs> and what she would say in those 30 seconds is she would say in little short sentences things that we'd spoken about at home in a much longer way. Now put your passport in the safe, make sure you wear sun cream, don't drink the tap water. It was a list. Boom, 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 boom. List, 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 do this, do this, do this, do this. This little short, these short lists of things that I can remember to do that we'd spoken about in much more depth before I got on the plane from Belfast International Airport. And as Paul comes to the last 30 seconds of the phone call with the Thessalonians, that's what he does here. He gives them lots of little reminders, lots of little sentences, just to remind them of the things that he taught them whenever he'd been with them a number of months ago, things that they were to do. So in verse 14, he reminds them how they're to treat the church leaders, the leaders of the church. Verse 14, and we urge you, brother, in Romans verse 12 and 13, now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. And then he goes on to say how they should treat one another. The end of verse 13, live with peace with each other. And then verse 14, and we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Then in verse 15, he reminds them what they're to avoid doing when they wrong each other, which is inevitable, by the way, in a church family, because we're all flawed. We're all going to wrong each other sometimes. But Paul reminds them with a sentence what they're to do. Verse 15. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to, um, and to everyone else. And then we're going to skip the next few verses because they're the ones we're going to hone in on. But let's look at verse 19 to 21. There he reminds them how they're to listen to preaching and teaching in the church. Verse 19. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything, hold on to the good. So when you listen to this sermon this morning, when you leave here, hold on to the good. Hold on to those things that the Lord has said to you. And then finally, in verse 22, he reminds them of something vitally important that they're to do in, every, uh, in all of their life. Verse 22, avoid every kind of evil. So he's just reminding them with these little short sentences of, of things that he talked at much more length of them whenever he was with them. And then in the rest of the passage, he just says goodbye. It's the benediction, it's the closing, it's the, it's the I love you and, and, I, and I miss you and, and I'll hopefully see you soon. So he finishes off the letter like that. Now, there could be a lot of sermons in just these verses, but this morning we're just going to hone in on verses 16 to 18. And, and Paul doesn't make it clear exactly why he's, he's giving them these verses, but, but I think he's giving verses 16 to 18. To, to teach them how to enjoy God more and more in their lives. So let's have a look at them together. Verse 16. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And this morning we're going to unpack these verses. We're going to try to understand what exactly they mean and also what they don't mean. 
And this morning my hope is that we see how these things, how doing these things can help all of us here enjoy God more and more. So the first thing Paul says, verse 16, I mean, let's face it, this looks like a completely impossible instruction, doesn't it? Be joyful always. What? Or as every other translation, every other translation of the English Bible says, it says, rejoice always. Now, there's a way to misunderstand this verse. And the way we can misunderstand this verse is that we can think that Paul is saying that as Christians we should be happy all the time. We can misunderstand this verse and think that what Paul's saying here is that we should walk around and no matter what's happening in our lives, we should have a big smile on our face and a spring in our step. And the problem is that if we think that this is what Paul's saying, we are going to be miserable, guilty feeling Christians. Because the reality of life is that that's not how it always is, is it? The reality of life is that sometimes our life just goes completely wrong. That sometimes things happen which are hurtful and harmful. That sometimes our life doesn't work out as we want it to be. Is Paul saying here that whenever these things happen, we're to paint on a smile? I read of a minister this week who went to visit a member of his congregation. And this member of his congregation, this man's life was really falling apart. He was going through all sorts of really different things. And, and the minister went there as his pastor, as, as the one who he can talk to, as the one to listen, as someone who, who wanted to get beyond the surface and really help this man with what he was going through. And when the minister said, listen, how are you really doing? How, how are you doing in the midst of all this? The man said, I'm just praising the Lord. I'm just praising the Lord. But the minister said, he wasn't. This was a mask he put on. This was something he felt he had to say because he'd read Paul's words, rejoice always. Paul is not saying here that we need to put on a mask when life is hard. And how do we know that? How do we know that's definitely not what he's saying? It's because we can look at the life of Jesus. Many of you here will know that the New Testament is written in Greek. And the shortest verse in the Greek New Testament is this one, Rejoice Always. It's got 11 letters, Pantot Karite. Sounds impressive, doesn't it? But in the Greek version of the Bible, in the Greek translation, in the Greek text, this is the shortest verse. But what's the shortest verse in our English version? John 11, 35. Jesus wept. If you were transported into that moment in time, if you were part of the crowd there as Jesus gathered around Lazarus's grave at his tomb, and you looked at the face of Jesus, you would have seen tears rolling into his beard. You would have seen a forlorn face, uh, a face that, that wasn't smiling. You wouldn't have seen him put on a mask. You would have seen a grown man weeping weeping and weeping and not weeping because of the, the death of his friend necessarily but weeping because death existed because this wasn't how it was meant to be <clears throat> because everyone he loved was going to experience this Jesus wept Jesus did not walk around with a big smile on his face all the time do you remember how the prophet Isaiah described the Messiah who would come as a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. When the Lord Jesus was on earth and when he faced things that were hard, when he faced things that were difficult, when he, when he was facing things that, that ideally he didn't even want to go through, like in the Garden of Gethsemane, he didn't put on a smile. He didn't have a spring in his step. He wept. So it's important we get this morning that, that Paul, whenever he writes this to the Thessalonians and when he writes this to us, he's not saying, listen, as Christians you need to all just paint on the smile all the time. That's not what he's saying. That's not what he's getting at. What he's talking about is, is, is trying to enjoy God. So 
taken away from everyday circumstances and taken away from this idea of having to paint on a smile. He's trying to teach us how to enjoy God more. And so what he's actually encouraging us to do here, I think, is to rejoice in the Lord. It's to rejoice in the Lord. Earlier in our prayers, we, we prayed about the things we enjoy. Our favorite food, our favorite drinks, our, our friends, our family, our hobbies. There's lots of stuff in life which God has really given us to enjoy and it's wonderful and we're thankful to him for it. But what Paul, I think, is encouraging us to do if we want to enjoy God more and more is to start to delight in him. To delight more in the Lord. To rejoice in the Lord. And the reason I think he's saying that is because we see this in, in all different parts of the Bible. We see it in some of Paul's other letters. In Philippians chapter 3, he says, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. At the end of Philippians chapter 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. We see it in the Psalms, Psalm 32, be glad in the Lord and rejoice. We see it in Psalm 37, delight yourself in the Lord. And what it means to rejoice in the Lord is clarified by the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. To rejoice in the Lord is to, to take joy in God. Do you have any friends? Well, I know you have friends. Do you have any friends who you just love to be with? Do you have any friends who you just delight to be around? Do you have any friends and, and you end up talking about them to other people and just how brilliant they are because you just love them so much because you're just overjoyed that you have them in your life? You've got those people, that's what we're to do with the Lord. To rejoice in Him, to delight in Him, to be glad we've got Him. To be glad we've got Christ. To be glad we've got all the blessings and benefits of the Lord in our life. Paul says, listen, Thessalonians, if you want to enjoy God more and more and more, then rejoice in Him. Rejoice in Him more and more and more. And what rejoicing is, it's, it's, it's from our emotions, isn't it? We're Presbyterians. Do we have emotions? You do, okay? We've got emotions. We have emotions. God's built us with emotions. He's, he's built us with feelings. And to rejoice in the Lord is, is to move beyond our head, declaring God is good, to letting our heart feel it. To move beyond our head to thinking it's good to be a Christian, to letting our heart really feel it, to delight is an inward feeling and emotion. And Paul says to the Thessalonians, delight in the Lord. Delight in Him and you'll enjoy it more and more. I was driving the boys to, to school this week and um, we listened to Sunshine 1049. It's a Christian radio station based in Belfast and if you haven't tuned in, it's, it's worth a listen. And we were driving to, to school and the sun was up. It was a beautiful morning, a bit like today. We were driving to school and a song came on and it just said, All my life you have been faithful. All my life you've been so, so good. I will sing of the goodness of God. And in that moment, I found myself delighting in the Lord. That's a little picture of what it's like. It's letting your emotions and your feelings just delight that you have God in your life. But Paul says, delight in the Lord, but then he says, always. Now, what does that mean? Again, does that mean that we're always having just to kind of be doing this? Is that just something we do kind of 24-7, 365? And if we don't, or we're not delighting in the Lord for five minutes at some point, we're breaking this snow again. It's a misunderstanding. The idea of, of doing something always is the idea of just making it a regular habit. Making it something you just do. Something that's just part of you. And I always brush my teeth. I always take a shower. I always use deodorant. I'm not just trying to convince you that I'm hygienic. But what I'm trying to show you there is that I always do these things, but it doesn't mean I'm always walking around with a toothbrush in my mouth, kind of spraying my armpits and shower, you know. But I always do these things. They're regular, they're part of my life, they're, they're a habit, they're just something that I do always. And that's what Paul's saying. Rejoice in the Lord and just make it something you do. Make it something you do every day. As you see the sun split the trees, rejoice in the Lord for making them and let you walk down and see them. As, as you spend time with your family and you hear the giggles, rejoice in the Lord for that blessing. As, as you go through your day and are aware of his presence with you, just, just rejoice that he's with you. 
Rejoice in the Lord always. I just want to say from experience, if you make this part of your life, if this is what you do, if this just becomes habit, you will rejoice and you'll enjoy what God more because you'll just be aware of his presence. I love that memory verse from the kids. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Well, when you rejoice in the Lord always, you're just aware that he's with you. And you become delighted that he's there. The next thing then that Paul says is pray continually. So do we all need to go be monks? Is that the command there? Again, I think we can misunderstand this. I actually saw a very funny video um, of this, and it was it was we sketch, and it was this man, and, and he was just so tired, and he was, like, blah, 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 blah. And he was walking around, and his friend was taking him around to, to get coffee, and he's trying to drink coffee, and, and so what are you doing? I'm just fulfilling the command, pray always, you know, pray all the time. It's not that. Again, it's the habit. It's making talking to your father a regular part of your life. It's making talking to God just something that you do. And Paul is saying here that when we make talking to God part of our life, when it's a regular thing that we're doing, again, we'll come to enjoy him more and more and more. But Paul doesn't go into details, but I think there are two types of prayer, two types of regular prayer that I think Paul would encourage us to have. <coughs> And the first one would be just a, a, a times in the day when you intensely pray. Times in the day when you intensely take just a little bit of time and focus on praying to the Lord. If, if you look back into the history of the Bible and, and the history of the Old Testament, you'll see that the Jews seem to have a pattern of praying once in the morning, once in the afternoon, and once in the evening. We see in the book of Daniel, don't we? It says there, in his upper room, with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees, Three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. So Daniel prayed three times a day. We see it in the life of David in Psalm 55. David says, As for me, I will call upon God. That's that's words for prayer. I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Then we see it in Jesus, don't we? We see it that him very early in the morning before it's daylight getting up and going to pray. And we see it in the evening and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up at the mountainside by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was there alone. The, the Jews seem to have this pattern of having a time of prayer in the morning, a time of prayer in the afternoon, and a time of prayer in the evening. And I'm not going to be as kind of prescriptive to say this is what you must do. But I think Paul is encouraging us as Christians to have points in the day when we intentionally turn to the Lord and pray. It might be in the morning. You, you look at your day ahead, you get your diary out, you see all the things coming up, and you just pray for the day ahead. It might be in the afternoon, you take five minutes and you pray for the people that you've met that day and you're going to meet. It might be in the evening and, and you look back on the day ahead and it's been and, and you confess your sins and where you maybe missed the mark and you turn to Jesus and rejoice in him. I want to encourage you to enjoy the Lord more and more. Start to take time, intentional time, where you just talk to the Lord, where it's built in into your day. But another type of praying that I think Paul might have had in mind, and, and maybe he expanded this more with the Thessalonians, is the idea of having a continual conversation with the Lord. To, to, to spend your day from the moment you get up to the moment you go to bed, just talking to the Lord as you go through your day. When you're facing something hard, silently pray, asking him for help. When something delights you, silently pray, thanking him and, and rejoicing that he's given it to you. When you meet someone, silently pray for them. I think that another type of prayer that can really help us enjoy the Lord is this continual conversation with the Lord as we go about our day. Sometimes in the church, we can think that it's the, the length of our prayers that matter. How long we pray. But there was a British evangelist called Smith Wigglesworth, and he was a bit like a W.P. Nicholson. He was a man who preached and, and people got saved and had their lives transformed. He was a powerful preacher. And one day, someone asked him about his prayer life, and what he said, I thought, was very interesting. He said, I don't often spend more than half an hour in prayer at one time, but I never go more than half an hour without prayer. I very 
rarely pray for more than half an hour. I'm not a prayer for a long time. I don't sit down and pray and pray and pray for hours. But it would be rare for me not to go half an hour without speaking to the Lord in some way. And I think this is the pattern of prayer, that a pattern of prayer that can help us to enjoy God more and more and more. I think it's something that can, can help us to just be aware of it and to delight in it in our everyday lives. And I want to encourage you to, to do that, to, to just start to speak to the Lord silently in your days. Finally then, we come to the last thing. And again, this is something I think that we can misunderstand. If you look at the text in verse 18, Paul says, give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances. Now, it's important again we know what he doesn't say. He doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances. Did you notice that? He doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances. Because let's face it, there are circumstances which we are not thankful for. Circumstances that we would rather not have. Circumstances that confuse us, that hurt us, that stress us, that frustrate us. Circumstances that really do make us question God's goodness. Circumstances that really do make us question if God is there at all. We have those times, don't we? Well, Paul doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances. Instead, he says to give thanks in all circumstances. And that's different. And what I think Paul is getting at here is that whenever you're going through those most difficult times of life, and it's really hard to enjoy anything of God, one way that we can do it is that we can we can look for the little glimpses of his, of his goodness. Those little glimpses of goodness that we see, even in the darkest of times, those little, little bits of light coming through the darkness. And even when life is hard, we can enjoy something of God by thanking Him for those little glimpses of goodness. This morning, if you're going through a difficult time, if this idea of enjoying God is a million miles from your mind, I understand that. But I also want to encourage you that you can, you can enjoy something of God, even in this moment, by looking for those little glimpses of goodness and turning those thanks. Thank you for that person who came to see me and helped me so much. Thank you that I got through today without it being just completely terrible. Thank you that you helped me in that moment. Thank you that you've comforted me. Thank you that you've been there for me, Lord. In these difficult times, we can even enjoy something of God as we give him thanks for the glimpses of goodness that we see. And then there's the flip side. When life is good, when things are wonderful, when all is bright and sunny, when it feels like you're walking on air, again, we can enjoy God in those moments by recognizing that all of this goodness and all of these things are from Him and by giving Him thanks. I wonder this morning what your default prayer language is. For some of you, maybe you always be guilty, so your default kind of prayer is always confession. For some of you, maybe you're always burdened by other people, so your default prayer is to pray for others. For you, maybe your default prayer is just to pray for help because you've got so much going on in your life that you need help with. Well, I want to encourage you that as you live out your day-to-day -day life, to make thanksgiving the default prayer of your heart. And as you begin to thank God, and as you become aware of God's goodness, and as you become aware that all things are from Him, I guarantee you, will enjoy him more and more and more. But folks, this isn't just Paul's kind of idea for the Thessalonians. This isn't just my kind of idea for you. This is the Lord's will for us. We see that, don't we, at the end of verse 18. Do these things, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God's will for you is to do these things and enjoy Him more and glorify Him more. So do these things. This morning, do you enjoy God? That's my question. Do you enjoy Him? Would you like to enjoy Him more? Do you want to enjoy Him? Well, if you do, you have a choice this morning. And the choice is very simple. If you're not yet a Christian, 
The choice is to trust in Christ and be brought into a relationship with God. If you don't know God, if he's a stranger to you, if you don't know who he is, then you can't enjoy him. I can't enjoy being friends with someone I don't know. But this morning, if you're not yet a Christian, you can be brought into a right relationship with the Lord and enjoy him. And the way you do that is by trusting Jesus to make it possible. Putting your trust in Christ to forgive your sins, which, which stops you enjoying God and to come into a right relationship with Him. And if that sounds confusing and difficult, I'll be outside of me. I'll have a chat with me. We'll talk about it. We'll meet for a coffee. But if you're a Christian here, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you do know something of enjoying God, but you want to enjoy Him more and more and more, then you need to make a choice. And the choice is to actually do these things. There's no point walking around here and saying, that was an interesting sermon, wasn't it? Oh, it's good to hear for him over there. No point in that. What's the point? It's useless. I'm telling you, if you want to enjoy God more, then you do what the Lord says, what his will is here. Leave here with a determination to live differently. To put these things into action. To rejoice always, to pray continually, and to give thanks in all circumstances. And I guarantee you will enjoy God more and more and more. Folks, we have a lot of wonderful God this morning. It's good to know Him. And but please do remember that God will be most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. Let's pray together. Lord, you are so, so good. And many of us can testify that all of our life you've been faithful. You've brought us through the most difficult of times. You've held us up when we felt like we were going to fall down. You've brought joy in the midst of sorrow. You've shown us glimpses of your goodness even in the darkest of days. And you've also given us wonderful days, days full of joy and happiness where we have so much to delight in. Lord, you are such a good God given us so many good things for our joy. But Lord, we declare this morning that the thing that we are most glad of is knowing you. We are most glad to have you in our lives. And Father, we would ask you this morning to help us to put these things into practice, that we may grow to enjoy you more and more and more, so that you might be more glorified in our lives. Put these words on our hearts this morning by your Holy Spirit. Give us the determination and all we need to begin to put them into action. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's sing our closing hymn, reminding ourselves of the wonderful love that God has for us as we sing love to God.
with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Amen.